Hi everybody, I trust you're all well. I uh, want to do another video, video number seven for the City and Guilds Carpentry and Joinery course. It's Principles of Building Construction, Information and Communication. And we're going to look at a thing called the Bill of Quantities. Now a Bill of Quantities is produced by a quantity surveyor. What the quantity surveyor is particularly keen to know about is the cost, okay? The cost of all building works. I don't mean cost just of materials. I mean cost of labor, cost of plant and machinery. So the building, um, the building quantity surveyor, he's the person who produces the bill of quantities. Now that little word bill should give you the indication that actually a bill is a list of costs. Okay, uh, it talks about the preliminaries, all the things involved before the building commences. Um, and it talks about all the measured quantities. So it's quite a technical thing. It's a little bit like a massive shopping list for the whole of a building project. Exactly how much it costs, exactly how many hours need to be worked. And it'll even give you the pounds and the pence of every item. So that's what the Bill of Quantities is all about. And what the Bill of Quantities does, it enables the client and it enables the builder to be able to know exactly what the building is going to cost when it's all complete. Of course, some prices go up a little bit as a, a, something progresses and sometimes work is discovered that wasn't foreseen at the beginning. But it does nevertheless give a very good and an accurate measure as to what the building is going to cost. So remember that phrase, bill of quantities. It's about the cost. Okay, now there's another phrase which we need to know about. It's called work schedules. Now the work schedule is a simple matrix. Down the side, down the left hand side will be a series of tasks. Across the top will be some um, indication of time. Now that time might be daily, it might be weekly, uh, it might be monthly, but the important thing is that all of the times across the top are consistent. And then what happens is the, um, the planner will work out how that work progresses. I'm going to give you a little picture of one and you can see exactly what I've got in mind. You'll see this on page 57. Let me just hold that up for you. Can you see that? So this is a list of tasks set against time. Now, it's called a Gantt chart, that's what it's called. And this enables us to be able to visually see tasks being done set against time. So this is a tremendously helpful tool. And this can be used in all sorts of ways. You need to remember that when you're doing, when you're planning work, there needs to be taken into consideration what's called a lead in time, lead in time. Now lead in time means the amount of time taken when something is ordered to the time when it can be delivered. Or you might, for example, say, well, I'm, I'm a carpenter. I need a lead in time of three days. You know, from the time when you ring me to ask me to go to do a job, I need to have at least three days or three weeks or three months, whatever it might be. I need some time to be able to clear other things and finish stuff so that I can be there on time. You can't order something and have it delivered today, generally speaking. If you need to order a digger, they will need to have some time to get that organized. So that's called lead in time. So that's two important things, bill of quantities and work schedules. Now, calculating quantities for materials is a really important thing. One of the things that you need to know about is that when uh, the metric system was introduced many, many years ago, um, that the first thing that the building industry did is they dropped all measurements except for the kilometre, the metre, and the millimeter. Now there's a, a thousand millimeters in a meter, and there's a thousand meters in a kilometer. So these are the only ones that we use. We don't use the centimeter, we don't use the decimeter, we don't use all those, we just stick to the millimeters and the meter. Generally speaking, as carpenters, we don't think in terms of a kilometer, do we? Well, that's, that's to do with length. If we were thinking in terms of liquid, then we would think in terms of the litre and the milliliter. 
okay? The liter and the milliliter. Now, in the, in the liter, there are a thousand milliliters, okay? Very simple thing, really, isn't it? We also need to think in terms of weight or mass, and we think in terms of the tone, T-O-N-N-E, which is the metric ton. We also think of the kilogram, which is which is referred to as kg. It's a, it's the kilogram is it's it's equivalent to something like about two pounds in weight. That's the kilogram, and then we have the gram, which is a very small measurement uh, of weight. There are a thousand grams in a in a, a kilogram. So there we are. Uh, those are the length, the liquid, and the weight. Okay, now. When we're measuring like this, we need to just practice these things and we need to become familiar. Now, most of you would, would have gone to school and you will have learnt all this stuff in your basic arithmetic lessons. But what, as, as a carpenter, you're going to have to use measurements all day long. I was, when I came into the industry, I was really surprised. I was pretty good at maths when I was at school, pretty good. But when I came into the industry, I could not believe all day long I was adding things, subtracting things, dividing things, multiplying things. So these are skills. I'm not going to give you lots of tests now. These are skills that you need to just practice for yourself. Just measure things. Measure the room you're in. Measure the furniture. Measure the house. And as you do these things, as you use addition, subtraction, multiplication and division, as you do these things, so you will learn and you will practice these skills and you'll become good at it. You really, as a carpenter, need to become fairly good at working out basic maths. For example, you might say to yourself, right, well, I'm in this room at the minute and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of skirting. So if I had to replace that skirting, how much would I need to order? So you need to work out the perimeter of the room. That's the distance all the way around the room. And this is a little practice. This is a little thing that you could do in all of the rooms of your house. Now, as well as working out, as well as working out perimeter, you may also want to learn to work out percentages. And you will definitely need to work out area. Okay, as a carpenter, area is a very important thing. In a basic, simple square room, that's easy. You just measure the one length by the other length and you'll get the area. But sometimes you'll be in a room that has odd little bits sticking out. So you'll need to add, add them up separately, multiply them separately and add them to the rest of the room. This is all very basic maths. And of course, you know how to work out the area of a triangle. Okay, that's really just the base multiplied by the height and then divided by two. That's because in a triangle, the bit that's missing is usually the same size as the triangle itself. So you just divide it by two and that gives you the area of a triangle. You might be fitting floor tiles. You might be fitting click flooring. You might be working out how many sheets of board go down on a floor. All these involve very simple calculations. You need to familiarize yourself with the right angle triangle, okay? And in a right angle triangle, we all know that the hypotenuse, which is the long side of a triangle, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. So this is Pythagoras' theorem, and we need to just be very familiar with how that works, and we need to be able to do that when called upon to do so. Okay, sometimes you might be on a job and you might come across circles. You might come across a very simple circle where you have to work out the circumference. The circumference is the distance around an object that is circular. So this is a little device here for charging my phone, for example. And it's the distance, okay, from there all the way around and back to the beginning again. OK, that's called the circumference. And the, we all know that the, the way in which you work out the circumference, it is um, pi d, which is 3.142 multiplied by the diameter. And that will give you the circumference. And, but you might have to be working out the um, area. And if you're working out the area of a circle, then it's going to be pi r squared. So r 
is the radius, which goes from the middle to the outside, and then pi, which is 3.142, multiplied by the radius squared. Okay, and it's the radius multiplied by itself. And that will tell you what the whole area of the circle is. This is very basic maths. I expect some of you are looking at me thinking, Stephen, I learned that five years ago. I learned that when I was in, in, in the infant school, maybe in primary school. Well, you may have done, but you might have forgotten since then. So it's important to practice. Another thing that comes up a great deal is volume. And of course, volume is not um, just the, the, the front surface. Volume is the depth of something as well. You're going into a third dimension. And pretty well most, th most people are able to work out the volume of a box. But you also need to practice to learn the volume of cylinders. Say, for example, you had a big tank. You need to know how many gallons of water you've got to put inside the tank to fill it up. Well, it's these things that you will need to practice. And the more you practice, right, the more proficient you'll become. You will also discover that on your phone is a really handy calculator. As everyone carries a phone with them all the time. You're allowed to use that calculator whenever you will, whenever you wish. As a joiner, you're going to discover that you'll be doing maths all the time. You'll be adding numbers together. You'll be taking numbers away. You know, somebody may say to you, can you just pop over to that house over there and figure out how much floorboard you're going to need? You're going to have to figure that out. So the way in which you do that is you find out how wide the floorboard is, okay? And you figure out how many you're going to need to go across that wall. So if it's a 120 floorboard, then what you do is you figure out the size of the room and you divide the size of the room by 120. And that'll tell you that you're going to need 35 boards or whatever it might be to cover the room. Then you need to work out the length of the room. So it's going to be 35 multiplied by the length of the room and that'll give you the running length, the overall running length of floorboard. Now these are all very, very practical skills. It's something that you really need to get into and you're your own tutor in some ways in this, in doing this. A lot of it you know, many of you are very intelligent, and if you find that there's a particular aspect of this very simple mass that's just a bit tricky, then come and talk to us and we'll help you. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is really your bed and, butter, bed and butter. You will be doing calculations all day long. So there we are. That's another little video. We look forward to catching up with you on the next. Have a great day. Bye for now.